Good evening, students. Let me know if you can see my screen and hear my voice clearly. Please put it in the chat. If you can hear my voice and see the screen. So Depanjali Rajalingam confirm whether you can see the screen. If yes, probably we will proceed further. So today's class, I will be covering uh, some basic fundamentals from uh, heat transfer to from thermodynamics and fluid mechanics. So most of the class will concentrate like 60 to 70 percent on covering the fundamentals of heat transfer. Then we take one few concepts uh, from thermodynamics and fluid mechanics. Okay. So along with this we will solve few problems okay and please feel free to ask questions in between if you don't understand the concepts okay so <coughs> we start with first heat transfer so <coughs> so heat transfer is what heat transfer is basically your energy transfer uh, whenever there by the virtue of temperature difference let us say you have two bodies, let us say. And let us say these two bodies, they are at different temperatures. Okay. And if you bring them in contact with each other, what happens? Because of the virtue of temperature difference, the body at higher temperature transfers energy to the body at <coughs> lower temperature. Okay. So... For heat transfer to happen, the first and foremost criteria is there has to be a temperature difference between the between the two bodies or between in the material medium. Okay. Now heat transfer <coughs> can happen in different ways. What are the different ways in which the energy get transferred via heat transfer? Okay. So energy get can transferred by a conduction, by a convection, and by a radiation. Give you to give you an example in our daily life let's say we want to take an example of a example of a conduction let's take that you you you, you have a metal rod okay and you heat one end of the metal rod okay and let us say you are touching the other end of the rod okay so what happens after a period of time okay initially the rod is let's say at ambient conditions at the environmental conditions but when you start heating the rod <coughs> at one end later point of time you will start feeling some kind of a heat at the other end okay so what happens when you heat it you are basically transferring energy to the rod at one end and then what happens this energy from one end to the other end of the rod it get transferred okay how does it get transferred it get transferred by a mechanism or by a mode which is called as conduction heat transfer okay conduction heat transfer okay <coughs> let's say you have like a hot porridge okay and you have a spoon when you dip your spoon into hot porridge okay the spoon, uh, one end of the spoon is going to become hotter. At later point of time, the, 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 the point from where you are touching the spoon, you will start feeling it hotter. So what happens in that scenario? <coughs> so what happens as soon as you dip your spoon into porridge, then since the porridge is a higher temperature, it transfers energy to one end of the spoon. Then that energy gets transferred through the spoon to your hand and that's how you try to feel it you feel that that yeah it's relatively hotter okay so this mechanism <coughs> in which energy get transferred okay this mechanism is basically what i am talking about is conduction heat transfer okay how does conduction heat transfer happens so I give you an example here. You can look at the example here. Let's say we look at this example. <coughs> Let us say this is a 
a solid bar that what we have so you can see solid bar what we have and let us say you have one bar the one end of the bar at a higher temperature and the other end of the bar is at a lower temperature what happens then basically <coughs> under this scenario because there is a temperature difference across the solid okay so energy get transferred through the solid so there is an energy transfer which is happening through the solid why because there is a temperature difference from one end to the other end within the solid because of this temperature difference energy get transferred through the solid and the mode or the mechanism by which this energy transfer happens we call that mechanism to be conduction heat transfer so this energy is getting transferred within the solid the mechanism is the energy transfer is happening because of the heat transfer okay why because why heat transfer because there is a temperature difference between the two ends of the solid okay that's why it's heat transfer and which mode of heat transfer we are talking this is conduction heat transfer okay so conduction heat transfer it occurs in solids it occurs in liquids and it occurs in gases also okay <coughs> so it occurs in solid liquid and gases all the three basically forms of matter what we discuss actually and if you look at the molecular level how the energy is getting transferred via conduction basically what happens is that heat flow the flow of heat which occurs due to the exchange of energy what happens from one molecule to the other molecule the energy is getting exchanged okay these molecules they don't move appreciably about their mean position so they are moving slightly about the mean position but there is no bulk motion of the molecules so one molecule which is having a higher energy because of the collision it transfers that energy to the other molecules and that's how the energy get transferred from one end to the other end also the energy can can also be transferred through due to the motion of free electrons okay okay <coughs> now we <coughs> practically understand what is conduction basically heat transfer through solid liquid or gases so basically for conduction to happen you need a material medium so one end from one end to the other end energy is getting transferred via convection so and energy is when it is getting transferred it is getting transferred through the medium so you need a medium for heat transfer or energy transfer to happen through conduction okay see here here also this block is your medium one end it is a higher temperature is at a lower temperature temperature difference is leading to energy transfer and energy transfer is happening from where it's happening through the solid okay how do you quantify this energy transfer how do you quantify so if we have to calculate that how much energy is getting transferred because of conduction through the bar how do we calculate it so basically this is basically given by one of the laws so there is no proof for this this is basically an experimentally proven law okay this law is called as fourier's law of heat conduction okay so what does it says <coughs> look at it a material in which temperature gradient exist okay so here gradient is missing temperature gradient exist when i say temperature gradient exists means temperature at one end is different from the other end heat flux through conduction in any direction is proportional to temperature gradient in that direction so let us say if you look at this bar this is our y and this is x <coughs> in this case we are saying the temperature is t1 along this face and temperature is t2 along this face okay so this is t1 this is t2 okay we are interested in calculating how much heat is getting transferred in the x direction okay so fourier's law says that the heat flux what is heat flux heat flux is heat transfer rate divided by the area normal to the direction of heat transfer 
so look at this this heat transfer is happening in the x direction and area normal to the direction of heat transfer is this hashed area okay so heat flux is area uh, heat transfer rate divided by the area normal to the heat transfer is proportional to temperature gradient in the normal direction okay so here our normal direction is x direction so we get qx is q dot by a is k is k times dt dx first of all it is proportional to dt dx because we are calculating the heat transfer in the x direction Fourier law says that the heat flux due to conduction is proportional to temperature gradient in that direction so heat flux is proportional to dt dx if you remove the proportionality sign you get a constant which is k okay this k is basically called as thermal conductivity of the material so it is a property of the material okay and <coughs> there is a minus sign which is put in front why a minus sign is being put front is so that you get a positive value of the heat flux or positive value of the heat transfer rate why because temperature gradient is always negative in the direction of heat transfer why because heat is flowing from a body at higher temp from a higher temperature to lower temperature so if you calculate dt dx which is nothing but t2 minus t1 by x2 minus x1 t2 is lesser than t1 so dt dx will be negative in order to make this quantity positive that's why a negative sign is put in front so you get minus k dt dx so in short <coughs> heat flux in x direction is proportional to temperature gradient in the x direction and if you want to find out heat flux in the x direction that is minus k times dt dx heat flux is heat transfer rate in the x direction divided by area normal to the direction of heat transfer which is this hashed area so if you want to calculate the total heat transfer okay nor in the x direction in the x direction it will be minus k a dt dx k is thermal conductivity of the material a is the cross sectional area normal to the direction of heat transfer any doubt here anyone any doubt in four years law any doubt no doubt okay so keep this thing in clear now we move to different mechanism of heat transfer this mechanism so first i we talked about conduction to give you an example i gave you like an example of a spoon you put a spoon in porridge and once you put it at the other end of the spoon which you are feeling you tend to feel it is hotter now this is example this mode of heat transfer which we are talking is the convection heat transfer so here also energy is getting transferred because of the temperature difference okay but this time the temperature difference is not within the same medium so look at it it is like if you want to look at the example so consider like you are having a heated plate let us say this is your heated plate and over this heated plate there is a fluid cold fluid which is flowing over the surface okay so practically practically you know when you flow cold fluid over the hot plate what will happen there will be heat transfer or energy transfer from the hot plate to the cold fluid okay and this mechanism by which the energy is getting transferred from the hot surface to the fluid this mechanism is called as convection heat transfer so convection heat transfer bit happens when it happens it happens between a fluid in motion so look at this this fluid is flowing over this hot plate and a bounding surface so this is the top surface of the heated plate okay top surface of the heated plate so convection heat transfer is happening because there is a fluid motion over a heated plate okay and fluid and the plate are at different temperatures okay 
<coughs> so now you know if you look at the fluid mechanics principle basic what happens if you have a free stream which is coming in on a solid surface so what happens the stream which is flowing which comes in contact with the plate surface it acquires the same velocity as that of the plate okay so if the plate is stationary this stream will acquire the same velocity as that of the plate so if plate is stationary the, the immediate stream in contact will be acquire the same velocity it will be zero now this stream <coughs> because it has come to rest it will try to retard the layer above it and similarly the layer layer above it and this is how the effect of the plate will be felt in the normal direction okay so what you will see you will now initially in the free stream the fluid velocity was uniform but when it flows over the plate what will happen there will be a velocity gradient now because of the presence of the plate so at the surface of the plate the velocity will be zero and when you move far away from the plate the fluid velocity will again become free stream. Okay, from where the velocity becomes changes from Z stream velocity, this distance has the boundary layer. Okay, and since we are talking about the velocity, this is velocity boundary layer. <coughs> Similarly, what happens when your fluid, let us say it is at a different temperature. The layer which comes in contact with the plate surface, it has the same temperature as that of the plate. So here you see it is at free stream temperature. It will come in contact with the plate. The temperature of the layer will increase. It will be equal to the free stream velocity. And that layer will try to heat the above layer. And similarly, this effect will be propagated in the upward direction. Okay, so the effect of the plate will be felt in the direction normal, in the normal direction. But this defect, this effect will be felt only up to a certain distance, after which the distance will be again become the free stream, whatever with which the fluid was coming. Now this distance, okay, the distance normal to the plate, from where the fluid temperature will vary from surface temperature or so from the plate temperature, to the free stream temperature, this distance is basically called as the thickness of the thermal boundary layer. So in the velocity boundary layer, your temperature profile changes from plate velocity to the free stream velocity. In thermal boundary layer, your temperature profile changes of the fluid from the temperature at the plate surface to the free stream temperature. Okay. So now let us say this is our solid surface. Okay, let us say it's one, one end is at a higher temperature, other end is a lower temperature. So what will happen through the plate energy is getting transferred by a conduction. Okay, now what happens? So energy gets transferred by a conduction, energy is getting transferred. Now this layer of the fluid which comes in contact with the plate surface, this is not moving, it is stationary. So this layer will also get heated by a conduction but subsequent layers are moving. So then heat will get transferred by a convection. So first layer of the fluid will be heated by a conduction only, by conduction only. Subsequently, it will be transferred by a convection because there is motion there. Close to the surface, there is no motion. So heat will be transferred by a conduction. Okay. <coughs> now, if you want to calculate, let us say you want to calculate, I want to calculate how much is the heat transfer which is happening from the plate to the fluid. How do you calculate it? So if you want to calculate that, there is a equation or a law which is called as Newton's law of cooling. So Newton's law of cooling says that heat transfer rate, okay, via convection, or basically, if you divide the heat transfer rate by the surface area, when I say surface area, it will be like the top surface of the plate. Okay. So heat transfer rate divided by the surface area of the plate. This is heat flux. This is given by 
h times ts minus t infinity where ts is your surface temperature of the plate t infinity is your free stream temperature okay so if then if you write the heat transfer rate it will be h times surface area ts minus t infinity so you can use this equation to calculate what is the heat that is getting transferred via convection via convection from the top surface of the plate to the fluid okay to the fluid okay what is ts ts is the surface temperature of the plate t infinity is the free stream temperature as is the surface area of the plate top surface area top surface area here i am referring only the top surface area but let us say fluid was flowing to the bottom also then i have to multiply two times because this heat is going from top and going from bottom right now i am looking only at the picture at the top side so that's why i am saying the heat which is going out by a convection from the surface heated surface to the free stream fluid that's why this surface area will be the top surface area of the plate okay now what are different ways in which convection can happen or by which in which the convection heat transfer can happen so you have day to day daily experiences which you will be seeing so let us say now this is a heated plate okay let's say this is a plate on which you have multiple heat sources which are mounted right now let us say you mounted multiple heaters on this okay now your objective is you want to maintain the temperature of these heaters to certain temperatures okay so what do you use and you know it is generating lot of heat so practically you may say that it may burn so what do you do you use a fan right so you are use a fan what will fan do fan will force the air it will create a forced flow over this heated surfaces or over this heated objects okay so then what will happen because this free stream fluid which is coming at a different velocity okay this surface which is at a different temperature as compared to the free stream so it will transfer energy so energy will get transferred from the heated objects to the free stream fluid to the free stream fluid and because you are creating a flow okay because you are creating a flow by mechanical means like a fan or pump or blower this kind of a convection is basically called as forced convection is called as a forced convection okay forced convection <coughs> there is another convection phenomena which is basically called as natural convection <coughs> in natural convection what happens as i am saying convection means you will have a heated surface and there will be fluid flow that will be happening around it in this case force convection you are creating the flow mechanically by fan pump or blower but in case of natural convection the flow air flow is happening naturally why it is happening naturally is that when you have these heated objects right the air which comes in immediate vicinity of this heated surface it will expand and it will become lighter and then that light air is going to move up so once the light air tends to move up the cold air which is heavy it will come rush rush in to fill that space and then what you see is a circulation a kind of a natural circulation is going to set up around this system okay and this flow is basically happening why because of the buoyancy differences okay the flow as soon as your air comes in contact with the heat it becomes lighter density changes and it moves up so the buoyancy force is basically the main responsible force for driving this natural convection whereas in force convection you are creating mechanical because of the mechanical fans or mechanical means you are creating flow okay so this is forced convection this is free convection there is another kind of convection where like you see in daily practices like you take a pan in which you have a liquid okay once you start boiling what happens liquid starts tends to change into vapor as soon as it's form vapor bubbles the bubble starts moving inside the liquid 
okay and this bubble because they are moving they create convection currents and because of this convection currents energy get transferred okay so these in short are different forms of convection heat transfer mechanism which are happening force convection natural convection or basically your phase change boiling or condensation in order to evaluate the heat transfer we need to use this simple equation that how much heat is getting transferred from the solid surface or let us say from the heated surface to the cold fluid or let us say from the cold fluid also to the uh, from the heated fluid to the cold surface also we can use this simple equation q is equals to h a s t s minus t infinity clear are you having any doubt is this clear let me know if you have doubt i can clarify now <coughs> we looked into one parameter which i call h this h is base for coefficient okay and this h is determined experimentally the value of h is determined experimentally means <coughs> determining it you may be able to determine it kind of a problems okay but most of the times uh, these are determined by performing experiments okay so if you look at the convection newton's law of cooling relation which we saw q dot so i we just keep h on this side and you can write q dot is q dot by a ts minus t infinity unit of q is watt a is in meter square and ts minus t infinity this is a temperature difference kelvin so its unit is watt per meter square kelvin okay what are the typical i am just not telling you what are the typical values of the heat transfer coefficient look at it free convection free heat heat transfer coefficient is lowest in case of gases 2 to 25 that means not much heat is going to get transferred your heat transfer rate 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 that 10 watts 15 watts rate will be lower when you have free convection like or uh, that to in gases 2 to 25 liquids sorry liquids it will be 50 to 1000 when you move from free convection to force convection look at from gases to gases now what happens your heat transfer coefficient has increased value has increased similarly in liquid it has increased when you have phase change phenomena basically you have the highest heat transfer coefficient the higher heat transfer coefficient okay now let us look at one problem here simple problem we have a flat plate of length 1 meter okay width is 0.5 meter it is placed in an air stream of 30 degrees blowing parallel to it convective heat transfer coefficient is 30 watts meter square per kelvin what is the heat transfer rate if the plate is maintained at a temperature of 300 degrees let's see how we can solve this problem okay so <coughs> what is being told to you is something like this so this is the plate we are talking about okay i'll just timing draw the thickness also so that you guys understand what is what is that why i am drawing the thickness part also in this case see <coughs> always means here look at it plate has both the surfaces right you may get confused okay why top and other things but most of the times if they have if they, if, if somebody wants you to use both the surfaces and other things they will explicitly specify and tell you that most of the times the mental picture is like the fluid is flowing over the top surface of the plate okay that's the mental picture mostly okay so top surface your free stream fluid which is t infinity it is 30 degrees okay length of the plate they have given here as 1 meter okay and width they have given as 0.5 meter 
ओके प्लेट लुक एट इट प्लेट इज मेंटेन एट 300 डिग्रीज ओके सरफेस ऑफ इज गिवन टू यू एस थर्टी वैट पर मीटर स्क्वायर कैलरी सो दिस इज अ हॉट प्लेट ओके दिस इज अ कोल्ड फ्लूड सो वॉट विल हैपन हीट विल बी ट्रांसफर्ड नाउ लुक एट इट आई एम जस्ट टॉकिंग अबाउट द टॉप एरिया because mental picture is always it is flowing on the top surface explicitly they will tell you in the problem you to consider both the faces if they are telling otherwise consider like this so what will happen <coughs> if we are assuming air is flowing one side so what will happen energy is going to get transferred from the hot plate to the fluid via mechanism of convection it transfer ओके, हाउ डू यू कैलकुलेट कन्वेक्शन हीट ट्रांसफर यू डॉट कन्वेक्शन यूज न्यूटन लॉ ऑफ कूलिंग सिंपल एच हीट ट्रांसफर को सरफेस एरिया मल्टीप्लाइड बाय सरफेस टेम्परेचर माइनस टी इनफिनिट ओके नोट हियर टी एस इज ग्रेटर देन टी इनफिनिटी सो क्यू डॉट कन्वेक्शन इज पॉजिटिव that means heat is getting transferred from solid surface to fluid or i should say hot solid surface to cold fluid okay so if you want to calculate q dot convection your h is 30 surface area top surface area how much is that 1 into 0.5 okay into surface temperature 300 and pre stream temperature 30 let's calculate what do we get as the answer Four point zero five watt. Ah, four. Ah, uh, yes. And you can convert it into kilowatt. If you want to look little bit mental picture more clear, see like this. What happens actually? I will just give you. Sorry. Let me just for few people to understand this part. so this is the plate which is there okay so your boundary layer is going to form as soon as it comes here this is your thermal boundary layer also you can think in that terms okay <coughs> and that's how the heat is going to get transferred from here to here the fluid temperature will be same as the free stream the temperature of the surface of plate temperature and here in this region it will be the free uh, free stream temperature and from hot surface to this this is how the heat is going to get transferred in that direction okay and since we are referring fluid flow on one side that's why i am taking the area on one side clear everyone clear right how we have done yes, this problem uh so simple look physically look at it energy transfer by a temperature difference method to calculate is Newton's law of cooling. Uh, H surface area T S minus T infinity. H is heat transfer coefficient. Which surface area to take? Clearly note how surface area is taken. T S T infinity. T S surface temperature of the plate and free stream temperature of the fluid. Okay, let's go back to the class. <coughs> and now we go back to the next topic. Next mode of heat transfer. so i just want to cover all the mode of heat transfer and then dive specifically into the conduction now we saw conduction 
basically i gave you an example heat transfer happening through a spoon practical example or <coughs> convection heated heated plate and fluid flow happening over that thing another mode of heat transfer is your radiation now what happens in radiation when you had conduction you needed a material medium solid fluid or gas okay there you need a material medium and within that material medium there is a temperature gradient at one side you have higher temperature other side you have a lower temperature because of the difference temperature difference within the medium energy transfer is happening via mode of conduction in case of convection also you have material medium you have a solid surface and you have fluid solid and fluid are at different temperatures so that's why energy transfer is happening through the material medium from within the fluid from the solid to the fluid but in case of radiation you don't need a material medium even if there is no material medium there is perfect vacuum then also radiative heat transfer can happen let us say you have one plate which is hot plate and that is facing another plate which is a cold plate okay and you put these two plates in perfect vacuum what will happen hot plate will transfer energy to the cold plate so there is no flow so there is no convection there is no material medium in between these plates it is vacuum but still energy transfer is happening this mode of energy transfer or mode is called as radiative heat transfer okay <clears throat> so all bodies which are at finite temperature which are having some finite temperature including us any body which is at a finite temperature it is emitting thermal radiation it is emitting thermal radiation okay now there are different ways in which we can think of energy transfer or how energy exchange is happening one way to think about energy exchange mechanism is by electromagnetic waves so if a surface is at some temperature okay and it is transferring energy by radiation so what is happening is the surface because it is at a certain temperature that surface is transferring energy via electromagnetic waves okay from one body at one temperature to the other temperature okay how do you quantify that okay so this this law is called as stephen boltzmann law simple law stephen boltzmann law says that for a black surface for a black body black body is an idealized concept it no surface no body is a black body for an idealized body black body your <coughs> the emissive power that is how much radiation is emitted by the body that is also a heat flux is q dot by surface area is sigma into ts power 4 where sigma is your stephen boltzmann constant and ts is the surface temperature of that body okay as i told you black body is an idealized concept or you can think like a benchmark surface so if you want to calculate how how much actual bodies are emitting radiation so this ratio of actual body how much it is emitting compared to the black body this ratio is called as emissivity okay so for an actual body times eb or epsilon times sigma into ts power 4 so if you want to calculate q it will be epsilon times sigma ts power 4 okay <coughs> this is the radiation which the body is emitting okay now i will i don't want to dwell into this let us take another example let us take you have a body at a higher temperature and you have ambient around it or surrounding around it okay and you want to calculate how much is the net radiative heat transfer which is happening then just take this formula just do have to do a slight modification so this is the radiation which is leaving this surface what this body is emitting similarly surrounding is also emitting okay so the how much surrounding will be emitting that will be you can say epsilon sigma as t surrounding to the power 4 so net radiation how much it is you use this formula then q net is epsilon sigma as ts power 4 minus t surrounding to the power 4 okay this is the net radiative heat loss from the body to the surrounding okay 
let us now little bit develop the concept of conduction heat transfer okay practical things so this is our slab if you don't like the slab think about spoon another this is a you can think this like a special kind of spoon which is okay now what is happening one end of that spoon is hotter as compared to other end so through the spoon energy is getting transferred and this energy transfer is happening via conduction okay is happening via conduction what you took you take a small piece of that okay so what happens imagine this is at higher temperature this is at lower temperature so energy is getting transferred in this direction same energy is getting transferred in this case because why we are studying one dimensional heat transfer this is one dimensional heat transfer what we are studying why because this entire phase is at one temperature this entire phase is at one temperature okay and this is the direction in which heat is getting transferred that is there and there is no temperature gradient in other directions those are same okay so there is temperature gradient only in the x direction then it becomes one dimensional for us now i take this small slab okay this is the heat conducted in and this is the heat which is conducted out so i will apply this first law of thermodynamics general first law of thermodynamics what is say let us take you take any system energy coming into the system minus energy going out of the system plus energy generated is zero okay okay <clears throat> because in heat transfer you may have some problem some issue, uh, some uh, special cases we are getting generated into the system okay so that's why i have taken otherwise it should be simply energy coming in equal to energy going out okay so q dot x is coming in and q dot x plus dx is going out plus q dot v which is volumetric heat generation that is heat generated per unit volume into volume i am multiplying it so qx plus dx how do i identify i like just apply taylor series expansion here okay and q dot v dv so what is dv for this volume it will be h times t into dx okay and to write qx so fourier's law what it says k t dx so k which area area normal to heat transfer h into t into dt dx so you get this equation d square t dt x square q dot v by k now special case assume there is no heat generation this becomes zero you get d square t dx square equal to zero okay you can in integrate one time dt dx is constant second time you get dx is equals to c1 x plus c2 okay apply boundary condition at x equal to zero your temperature is t1 at x equal to l your temperature is t2 so what do you get as temperature distribution you get tx is t2 minus t1 by l x into l t1 it's a linear temperature distribution your temperature is linearly decreasing from one end to the other end. okay <coughs> so if i want to calculate heat transfer rate it is k a dt dx minus k a dt dx is what differentiated one t2 minus t1 by l minus sign you can take inside you can write this as t1 minus t2 l by k a or t1 minus t2 by rth what is rth i am saying rth is resistance to conduction heat transfer so you can draw an analogy between this equation t1 minus t2 by r with ohm's law v1 minus v2 by r e okay so ohm's law says if there is a electric current flowing through a resistor voltage drop v1 minus v2 is i into r e so i becomes v1 minus v2 by r e so using the electrical analogy i can think this heat transfer rate also in a similar form okay so one end yeah i can represent it by one node other end i can represent it by other node the resistance of the material i can represent it by this resistance and this resistance is what l by k a so i can represent it like a linear resistor in this case current is flowing in this case heat is flowing clear is it clear till here
Anybody having any doubt? Anybody having any doubt here? Okay, let's go ahead. <coughs> let's look at matter. Now, <coughs> let us say, instead of one solid, now you have two solids. Okay. You have two solids. Now, one end is maintained at T1, other is maintained at T4. Now, what happened? When you joined these two solids, okay, there was not a perfect contact at this at this junction okay so you took one block and you pressed another block with it but still this particular joint was not a perfect joint okay was not a perfect joint then what happens so we studied the concept of resistance okay that if you have a material so look at it this is a material this is a linear temperature distribution because this material has certain thermal conductivity, some length and some cross-sectional area, it is offering resistance to heat transfer. That is why your temperature is getting dropped from T1 to T2. If resistance is lower, temp will be lesser. Okay. In this case, when you are joining these two solids together, right? Because you are not able to join them properly, at the interface now you start to get an imperfect joint and that imperfect joint it leads to resistance to heat transfer so it adds additional resistance in the flow of heat transfer okay and this heat resistance is basically called as contact resistance thermal contact resistance why contact thermal contact resistance because it is happening at the contact of two different materials or two materials same materials also but two different materials which are physically distinct okay if you zoom it at the contact surface what will happen so if you look at the microscopic structure it will be like this certain places these two materials will be in contact certain places there will be an air gap air is a poor thermal of has very poor thermal conductivity or it or in short you can think it offers very high resistance to heat transfer okay so when you zoom at this interface you see that at discrete connections these two parts are in contact at and certain places there is an air gap so that's why at the interface it is an imperfect contact. It is not a perfect contact because of which you are getting a contact resistance. Physically also you think, let's say you bring a hot metal and you cold metal. What you have to do it to transfer heat? You have to apply sufficient pressure to have that kind of a contact so that heat can get transferred. Otherwise, what happens if you keep, if you just touch them or touch them very lightly what will happen there will be an air gap between the two solids okay so there will be resistance to heat transfer heat is not getting transferred from the interface okay so what happens then the heat which get transferred across the interface it get transferred via two paths one at these discrete contacts other it has to flow through the air and air offers like very high insulation high resistance so interface is now offering the resistance to heat transfer and this how do we quantify that this resistance per unit interface area is called thermal contact resistance so thermal contact resistance is delta t across the interface t2 minus t3 divided by q dot by a okay so if i draw the thermal resistance network for this path this block i can represent by one resistor this contact resistance i can represent it by one resistor this block i can represent it by a third resistor okay <coughs> now <coughs> on what factor this thermal contact resistance depend it depends on the surface roughness it depends on temperature and pressure of the interface it also depends upon the type of fluid which is entrapped at this interface okay 
if you want to reduce the thermal contact resistance or re decrease it then you can decrease it by two ways either you increase the interface pressure that means you apply lot of pressure that means you are you are taking two solids one side you are applying pressure and other side also you are applying so you are pushing from this side also you are pushing from this side so that there is high enough pressure at the surface so that it creates a good contact or you decrease the surface roughness basically so that there are more of these contacts that gets developed and then you reduce the thermal contact resistance now let us look at one problem here look at it what is it how can thermal contact resistance between two solid bars be reduced it can be done by decreasing the joint pressure of compression it is independent of joint pressure it can be done by increasing the joint pressure of compression or it can be done by decreasing the ambient gas pressure so what do you think is the answer here if you have to reduce the thermal contact resistance how do you can reduce the thermal contact resistance You have to reduce it. You, know, you can't see if you have to reduce. Just think practically, okay? I'm, I'm, this is a very practical problem also. Let us say you have two solids, okay? One is hotter, other is colder. You want and you know at the interface, if the contact is not proper, it will add a lot of resistance to heat transfer. So heat will not get transferred. So what you will do? You will push very tightly both the solids, right? You will apply enough pressure so that the interface is a perfect contact. So now tell me what will be the answer. Uh, answer C. This can be done by increasing the joint pressure of compression. Okay. <clears throat> now let's look at it. The another scenario. Now, till now I was telling you that solid one end is higher, other end is lower. Now what I am telling you, let us say we are having on one hot fluid. Then we have a separating wall. Other side we have a cold fluid. Example can be your heat exchanger. Okay, in heat exchanger, in one pipe you have hot fluid flowing. Let us say this. And the separating wall between hot and cold fluid, this is the wall. So heat is actually get, will get transferred from hot to the cold fluid. But in this case, how does it happen? How does the energy get transferred? Now look at it. This is your fluid, hot fluid. Okay, hot fluid is going to transfer the heat to this surface of the solid via convection. Once this energy comes by convection to the solid, it will be conduction. Through this solid, it will be again conduction. Through this solid, it will be again conduction. Now this is a hot surface. This is a cold fluid. Again, heat is going to get transferred via convection. Okay. <coughs> if you want to it by a circuit how did it start here t infinity one draw one resistance this resistance is your convection resistance how do you write it you write it as one over h into area area which area surface area so h1 is here second is your conduction resistance which is what l by k a so this is l1 l a k a by a a second lb kb by a a a third lc kc by a and fourth again by a convection which is one over h2 by a all these resistances are in series okay why because the heat which get convected same heat is getting conducted same conducted conducted and again convected so it is the same heat which is flowing through all these things what is R convection? 1 over HA. That is H1 into area. Conduction L by KA. <coughs> so, if I want to write what is the heat transferred by convection, look at it. 1 over H, if you take, it will be HA delta T. Okay. So, this is convection heat transfer. If you take KA by L, so KA L by T1 minus T2, this is heat transfer by conduction in solid 1. K L by K B into a T2 minus T1. This is heat transfer in the solid B. 
T3 minus T2, T4, LC, KC by A. This is heat transfer in slab C. T4 minus T infinity to 1 over H2 by A. This is your heat transfer from the solid surface to the fluid. Look at it. When I gave you example, I told you hot surface to fluid. But here what is happening? From hot fluid to surface, it is getting transferred. Okay. Just use the same formula. H A. But instead of Ts minus T infinity, it becomes T infinity minus Ts. Because T is greater than T. Okay. You can combine all these resistance in series by single resistance. And say it is to a total resistance. Then you can write T infinity 1 minus T infinity 2 by R total. R total is what? Addition of all these resistances. Convection, conduction, 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 convection. Okay. And then you can use the resistor formula. Q dot becomes T infinity 1 minus T infinity 2 by R total. Sometimes people define overall. Right now look at it. In convection, I told you H is the heat transfer coefficient from one fluid surface to the hot uh, to the cold plate surface. Similarly, it can be from plate hot to the hot surface to the plate, uh, hot uh, plate surface to the fluid also. So this is the heat transfer coefficient. Similarly, people define when they say we want to define an overall heat transfer coefficient. How it is defined? Q dot is U into A T infinity 1 minus T infinity 2. Directly from here to here. Or then T infinity 1 minus T infinity 2 is 1 over U A. So if you compare this expression with this expression, what do you get? Overall heat transfer coefficient is 1 over R total into. Is this clear? Is this clear? Anyone having any doubt what I am doing here? Any doubt? Ask if it is not clear. I can spend some time, not a problem. Clear to everyone? Or do you want me to spend more time here? <coughs> okay. Let's go ahead. Now, I took a plain slab case. Okay. So, we took a, <coughs> till now we already, we always took a slab or a rectangular bar or something like that. Now, what I want to take is a rectangular system. That is, I want to take a pipe. Okay. I want to take a pipe. Okay. Now, what happens in the pipe? Let us fluid, and you have cold fluid. So, what will happen? Hot fluid will transfer via convection to the inner surface of the pipe. Then, through the pipe, this will be conduction. And finally, from the outer surface of the pipe, heat is going to get outside by convection if there is cold fluid. Our objective is now we want to write the conduction equation through the pipe in the radial direction. How do we write it? Start with this law. E dot in, E dot out equal to E generation. Okay. So in this case, heat transfer is happening in the radial direction. So we consider this small strip. This, this small strip. Okay. So if you want to think in terms of a cylindrical system, right? In a pipe, we are taking a small circumferential thickness through the pipe. Okay. And we are trying to analyze through that thickness. Let us say Q dot R is coming in. Q dot R plus DR is going out. And let us say Q dot V it is getting generated. So again use E in minus E out plus E generation equal to zero. Steady state. So what is coming in? Q dot R is coming in. What is going out? Q dot R plus DR is going out. So heat is getting conducted in. Heat is getting conducted out. Let's say there can be heat generation also within the system which I am saying Q dot V into DV. Okay. What is DV? If I want to calculate the volume of this element, it will be 2 pi R into DR. 
ओके टू पाई आर एल इन टू डी आर बिकॉज टू पाई आर एल इज द सर्फेस एरिया इन टू डी आर ओके हेयर क्यू डॉट आर क्यू डॉट आर कैंसल हेयर बेसिकली आई एम राइटिंग दी लॉ बेसिकली आई एम राइटिंग द टेबल सीरीज एक्सपेंशन सो वॉट इज क्यू डॉट आर क्यू डॉट आर इज माइनस के ए डी टी डी आर Why DTD are four years law? I am calculating heat transfer in the radial direction, so I have to consider temperature gradient in the radial direction. I have to take area normal to the radial direction. Area normal to the radial direction is what two pi r into L, which is this. Imagine this cylindrical shell. <coughs> okay, then two pi k comes out. You get DDR of R DTD R. Q dot V, two pi R L into D R. So this is the equation that you get. Now let us say again we say the same equation. There is no volumetric heat generation. So you get this as an equation here. You solve this equation, okay? Integrate it, okay? And then you apply the boundary condition. What are the boundary condition? Inner surface temperature is T one. Outer surface temperature is T two. So you can find C one and C two again here. Once you solve C one C two, this is the temperature distribution that you get. This time, temperature distribution is not linear. In case of a cylindrical system, temperature distribution is logarithmic in nature. In case of plane system, what we studied, plane slab or rectangular bars, it was linear. Here it is logarithmic in nature. let us say you want to find out how much heat is getting transferred in the radial direction how do you want to calculate it apply fourier's law q dot r is minus k a dt by dr so area normal to the direction of heat transfer area normal to the direction of radial direction is 2 pi r l so minus k into 2 pi r l dt by dr okay <coughs> so in this expression dt by dr is c1 by r so substitute c1 by r and c1 value is there once you put that and simplify it similar to the plane slab case you can write this expression so q dot r is t1 minus t2 that is temperature at the inner surface minus temperature at the outer surface divided by an expression which we are near resistance but this resistance is now different from the plane slab case okay in cylindrical system the resistance is log of r2 by r1 this is r2 this is r1 log of r2 by r1 divided by 2 pi kl where k is thermal conductivity l is length otherwise the form is very much same t1 minus t2 by rth only thing is plane slab case rth is l by k a in case of cylindrical system your rth is in log r2 by r1 divided by 2 pi kl again you can represent it by an electrical circuit this is v1 this is v2 this is r electrical this is the current and the equivalent form is again q dot t1 minus t2 by rth only thing is for cylindrical system you should remember your resistance to heat transfer conduction heat transfer is log r2 by r1 by 2 pi kl Okay. it is different from the plane slab case clear not clear not clear actually <clears throat> sir is this in this picture uh, <coughs> what is r1 and r2 sir r1 uh, couldn't understand sir okay let me tell you see imagine this is a pipe okay this is a pipe and i am showing the inner section here So R one is the inner radius of the pipe. Okay, let me. So let this me sir, in this picture, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, no, let me let me give you some more uh, perspective so that you clearly understand. Think like this. Okay, think like this. Probably this will help you. Sorry, but think like this. this is the cylinder okay 
and imagine you have hot fluid flowing through this okay and let's say outside you have cold fluid which is flowing okay this hot fluid is at some temperature t infinity 1 cold fluid is at some temperature t infinity 2 so what happens we are saying how does heat transfer happens in this case what we are saying is like from here heat will get transferred via convection to the inner surface then heat will flow via conduction through the solid and then finally it is going to go to the cold fluid via convection is this clear yes sir is this your objective is you are trying to find out this let us say this is t1 and this is t2 so how heat is getting transferred so from the cold fluid heat is getting transferred via convection so imagine a resistor 1 over h1 into a i will say inner area let us say so t1 okay now then it is getting transferred via conduction t2 that resistance is now in log r2 by r1 by 2 pi kl then from the outer surface it is getting transferred via convection that becomes let us say if i want to call that as h not an external area in a not it is h not a not okay <coughs> for your clarity let me write it like this t2 minus t infinity 2 look at this expression 1 over h not a not if you simplify it what it is it is h not a not t2 minus t infinity 2 right similarly t1 minus t infinity i is 1 over h i a i what is this h i a i sorry this is t infinity 1 and this should be t1 t infinity 1 minus t1 and similarly you can write this one <coughs> now your objective is you wanted to get this expression what is the resistance how do you calculate so what did you do is that you considered a shell here like this in the cylinder you consider this small shell here, like this just i am trying to draw here here in between so what happens from here convection then heat is getting transferred via conduction through the solid okay now you are trying to write the energy balance for this shell so inner cell is at certain radius r thickness of this is dr so here heat will enter via conduction through the solid it will be conduction only so heat will entering the solid will be q at q dot r that is heat in coming inside the solid via conduction is q dot r heat going outside this shell at radius r plus dr is q dot r plus dr is it clear now or not clear uh, clear sir <clears throat> uh, excuse me sir sir uh, on some be better picture <laughs> yeah excuse me sir so, so uh, yeah. what we are doing is we are finding this uh, resistance uh, through conduction mm -hmm. Madam, when we are yes yes the, yes conduction is taking place then we find out the resistance in the uh, material that is conducting yes yes okay so this and ln r2 no. by r1 is the conduction uh, resistance of the conduction part uh, of the material you say of the material because uh, through which is it yes. is conducting conducting so it is in log so there is there is geometry aspect because of the radius and then you have 2 pi k l k is thermal conductivity so this resistance will be different if you have mm -hmm. a copper 
लेट एस ए पाइप और ए स्टील पाइप और ए वुड पाइप और ए प्लास्टिक पाइप राइट प्लास्टिक आर पुअर कंडक्टर्स इट हैज लो हीट ट्रांसफर कोफिशियन हीट ट्रांसफर लो कंडक्टिविटी कॉपर आर वेरी गुड कंडक्टर इट हैज हाई के वैल्यूज सो दिस रेजिस्टेंस विल बी डिफरेंट फॉर डिफरेंट मटीरियल दिस रेजिस्टेंस विल डिफर बेस्ड ऑन योर आर वन आर टू ऑल्सो ओके क्लियर नॉट क्लियर Anyone so else clear, have doubt? This is clear now, but the derivations are too uh, <laughs> tedious. So yeah, It's too tedious. Ha, huh. ha. Uh, so see, basically, if you look at it, right, you need not to remember the derivation. Need not to remember the derivation. You can remember just the crux part of it. Need not because derivations are nowhere will be coming in the exam. Okay. i have done derivation only for your clarity okay derivation is only for your clarity you can remember this take away you can remember this okay if you want i can spend time on derivation also the you will be able to understand that also clearly but probably we don't have that much time so remember this for the plane slab it was l by k a for the cylindrical system this is your resistance okay okay other students also let me know if you guys are able to follow or not able to follow sir could you explain uh, this uh, when we take this 2 pi rl minus k 2 pi mm -hmm. rl we are taking this mm -hmm. uh, value normal to the uh, yes sir could you explain this once more okay let this part see your law says that q is q dot is minus k a dt dn understand this nn in whichever direction you are trying to find out the heat transfer same direction you are trying to take the temperature gradient and this area is normal to the direction of heat transfer simply understand from here i will just draw that area itself for you if you take this shell inner surface right this is the area and this is your radius r is increasing in this direction right so which is the area so this is the direction in which i am trying to find out the heat transfer area normal to the heat direction of the heat transfer is what it will be this complete area the lateral area which is 2 pi r into l l is this length and r is this r clear not clear clear sir clear ha huh? we just so taken the area of the cylinder that's all yeah not cylinder i'll say you can say any surface in between the cylinder what you are considering if so you are at radius this formula is specifically for a cylinder if ha huh, cylinder but see here see this you can apply it at different places right so let us say i i write this law at r1 so what you will write minus k a 2 pi r1 into l dt dr at r1 right let us say now you want to find it out at r2 what minus k 2 pi R two L T T D R at R two clear or not clear? Hmm. hmm? Yes, sir. Now, ah. <coughs> okay. Let me go ahead now. So, in short, remember this. Crux is this. for a plane slab this is the final thing which you should remember because derivations are too lengthy for a plane slab this is what you should remember 
L by K A Q dot Q dot is T1 minus T2 L by K A okay similarly in case of a cylindrical system this is in log r2 by r1 by 2 pi kl q dot that is right if you remember this done you are there let's look at it again now probably you will be able to appreciate it in terms of resistance what i am trying to do is see how i am trying to draw again same problem i am saying i have a pipe inside the pipe i have hot fluid now instead of single pipe i have a pipe which is made up of composite material so inner one i have one material second third material which are wrap on one one over the other and outside i have a cold fluid I am considering heat transfer in the radial direction. So what happens? From the hot fluid to the inner surface, there is convection. Okay. So convection resistance is 1 over H into area. But which area? Inner surface area. 2 pi R1 into L. Then I have conduction happening in this solid. T1 and T2. Its resistance is in log R2 by R1. 2 pi k a into l then i have conduction happening here through this solid its resistance is in log r3 by r2 by 2 pi k b into l then conduction happening in this space in log r4 by r3 2 pi k c into l then outer convection that is 1 over h2 into 2 pi r4 into l into t infinity all the resistances are in series. Why? Because the heat which get transferred via convection, let us say 100 watt is getting convected. That 100 watt is only getting conducted. That is getting conducted. Conducted. And finally 100 watt is only getting convected out. Okay. So these all resistances you can combine and put it in R total also. Total resistance. Because these are in series, you can basically add them up also. And because same heat is flowing, look at it, same heat is flowing. So what is the heat transfer by convection? You see, whatever I write here, like T infinity minus T1, 1 over R, okay, 1 over H1 by 2 pi R. If you take it to the top, it is what? H1 into area, which is heat transfer via convection. This is heat transfer via conduction. This is heat transfer via conduction. Heat transfer via conduction. Heat transfer via convection. That is there. And let us say if somebody defines it overall heat transfer q dot is equal to u a t infinity 1 minus t infinity 2. Now in this case because which area he will take inner or outer he can define two heat, you know, overall heat transfer coefficient either based on the inside area or outside area. So if you define inside area you can say overall heat transfer coefficient based on inner area. If it defines on based on outside area you can say overall heat transfer coefficient based on outer area. Okay. This is not that important. Circuit should be important. You should be able to understand and draw the circuit or understand the values which I am putting. here. Is the circuit clear for everyone? What I have drawn here and how I am putting resistances? Please put it in the chat clear if it is clear. If it is not clear, put it not clear. I will explain again. Hey, ask uh, any question sir uh, for uh, this convection temperature profile will that be also uh, is linear no 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 not linear see i already told you these are logarithmic natures okay. uh, and uh, ask ask because these uh, are cylindrical systems in cylindrical systems the temperature distribution is not linear logarithmic uh, convection profile, uh, sir. Ah, convection that, profile uh, is about uh, that is a boundary layer profile. 
that is a boundary layer profile it will not be linear it will not be linear convection profile is are never linear actually those are non-linear curves okay uh, okay sir. Hmm. inside the solid when you studied plane wall right when i talked that temperature distribution is linear inside the solid fluid it is not linear okay unless he gives you then you take it otherwise it is not okay <coughs> okay <coughs> look at this problem now he is saying a hot fluid is being conveyed through a long pipe of 4 cm outer diameter covered with 2 cm thick insulation it is proposed to reduce the conduction heat loss to the surroundings by one third of the present rate. Okay. <coughs> by further covering the same insulation material. What is the additional thickness of insulation that we need to add? Okay. Let's look at it and understand the problem. What what is being talked here about that okay yes look at let's look at this one see <coughs> so let's draw this Okay, let's say this is your pipe. On top of the pipe, now you are putting an insulation. Okay, if you have problem to visualize, this structure is like this. This is a pipe which I am talking, a cylinder. Okay, this view which I am showing is probably you can think front view only. Probably. So, insulation and other things are on top of this. So, what he has given here is look at this this radius outer radius of the pipe he has told this is four centimeter not not two centimeter radius diameter is four centimeter and this thickness how much they have given they have given two centimeter so if this is two this is two this total let us say this is i say r1 R2 will be how much? 4 cm, right? 4 cm, right? <coughs> so let us say this temperature is, I will say T1, and this temperature is, let's say, T2. Okay. And I draw a resistance now. So resistance is it's a cylindrical system upon 2 pi k L T1 T2 and Q dot is flowing through it. Okay. So Q dot is how much? T1 minus T2 by log r2 by r1 by 2 pi k so t1 minus t2 is q dot into l dot r2 by r1 by 2 pi k l So what he is doing now, he wants to add additional resist. He wants to increase the thickness. So let us say in the first case, it was Q dot. Q1 was Q dot. You are getting heat transfer. Now by adding this insulation, he wants to make it Q dot as Q dot by 3. He wants to reduce the rate of heat transfer. Initially, if it was 300 watt was going, now he wants to make it like 
100 volt these are hypothetical number just for example i am giving so t1 minus t2 so in this case t1 minus t2 will be assumed to be same okay so let us say you write for the case one q1 in log r2 by r1 to pi kl okay is equal to q2 dot in log now what is asking i have to add more insulation so let us say when i add more insulation okay that time my outer radius is r so then i get r by r1 upon 2 pi k n because insulation is same material right this k these things everything get cancelled okay and now what is q1 q1 is this relation will be there so what do i get in log r2 for the case one what is r2 r2 is 4 r1 is 2 okay this will be 1 by 3 in log r divided by 2 so i get 2 3 in log 2 in log r by 2 this is nothing but in log 2 by 3 in log r by 2 which is nothing but 8 divided by r by 2 r is 16 so he is saying what is the additional thickness i need to add so initially what is r2 r2 is 4 cm right r2 is how much 4 cm right how much additional i need to add to make it so r minus r2 that is 16 minus 4 12 cm i need to add more correct clear not clear sir Is i have a clear? question yeah ask sir uh, in this question i feel it is irrelevant but uh, the inner and outer diameter will also have a resistance they are the uh, ah, that is why the question is not not <laughs> it's not 100% completely defined in that sense you are absolutely right what you are trying to catch but then you don't have complete data you don't have complete data you see once you try to take that part into picture right you don't have complete data to solve the problem yes sir but it, it becomes why, very confusing while solving the question again the... Ah, so that's why you look at it i took this assumption right you could have questioned this assumption also Sir, why did you take T1 minus T2 as constant? Yeah, exactly. Because sir, there will be uh, resistance in the, uh, in the uh, inner and outer, outer diameter also. Ah, because you are adding more material, your outer uh, uh, resistance is also changing, right? Convection, right? Yes, sir. If you if you look at if you look at the complete, right? That's why <laughs> you you. you pointed out the right thing right let us say i want to draw, draw the complete network let us say so h i a i is the okay let me draw you pointed out the right thing but that that's the nature of the problem here the problem is not completely or clearly defined that is there see if let us say this is my inner fluid then i have one over h i a i okay then i have my resistance let us say of the solid plate i am just saying right now the solid uh, uh, pipe what i have. after that i have the resistance of my insulation okay i am just adding right now this this is i say k1 k2 into n and after that i have my outer resistance for the convection which is going to the cold fluid let us say i am just adding adding that part h outer a outer 
as you increase insulation right your a not also increase changes right so that's why it is tricky here so that's why in this problem he wants you to specifically focus here and you can do it only with this assumption clear yes sir understood huh so some <laughs> yeah completely i understand that part okay sure so let me go ahead now the other part no okay <coughs> 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 okay now i will little bit talk about the uh, heat exchangers how do you do solve the heat exchangers analysis how do you do heat exchanger analysis basically okay so so in heat exchangers what happens look at it okay so the configuration which i am showing here is what is called as a parallel flow so i have taken all the exchangers here right now i am I'll talk one and then explain. Look at it. Parallel flow heat exchangers. In heat exchanger, what happens? Basically, you have like common in all the application in household also. You have hot fluid flowing and you have cold fluid flowing. Purpose is you want to transfer heat from hot to cold fluid. That's the only purpose. Now, why we call it as a parallel flow heat exchanger? I am calling it parallel flow because hot and cold fluid are flowing in the same direction. Okay. So if this is the direction in which hot fluid is flowing. In the same direction cold fluid are flowing. So that's why they are having parallel direction and this heat exchanger is called as parallel flow heat exchanger. In this heat exchanger what happens? The hot fluid is coming with some temperature let us say THI which is the inlet temperature. It is going out with a temperature TH0 which is the outlet temperature. Cold fluid is coming in with a temperature which I am calling it as TCI and going out with a temperature TC0. Let us say the mass flow rate of the hot fluid is M dot H and its specific heat capacity is CPH and for the cold fluid is M dot C and its specific heat capacity is CPC. Okay. So basically first equation. If you want to apply first law of energy balance, how do you apply to the heat exchanger? Let me apply it here and show it to you. Probably. So look at it here. So now you have heat exchangers, right? This. So this is your heat exchanger. This I will put as a dividing wall. Okay. So your cold hot fluid is coming in, it is going out. Cold fluid is coming in and cold fluid is going out. Okay. So, <coughs> if, you'll, if you apply the energy balance. Okay. So, if I say what is the heat lost by the cold fluid or heat lost by the hot fluid. Heat lost by the hot fluid will be M dot of the hot fluid into specific heat of the hot fluid multiplied by the inlet temperature minus the outlet temperature this is the heat which is lost by the hot fluid what is the heat gained by the cold fluid which is nothing but m dot c specific heat capacity of the cold fluid tci tc naught minus tci this is the temperature thi with which it is coming in TH0 with which it is going out, TCI with which it is coming in, TC0 with which it is going out. Okay. <coughs> and you can equate both of them also. M dot H, CPH is THI minus TH0 is M dot C, CPC. TC0 minus TCI. Okay. So let us say if he gives you any three and ask you to find the third one, fourth one, you should be in a position to apply this equation and get the temperature for the any one temperature. Okay. Now, product of M dot mass flow rate into specific heat of the fluid is called as heat capacity rate 
तो लेटेस्ट से दिस इज सी सी दिस इज हीट कैपेसिटी रेट ऑफ द कोल्ड फ्लूड सिमिलरली एम डॉट एच सी पी एच इज कॉल्ड एज सी डॉट एच दिस इज हीट कैपेसिटी रेट ऑफ द हॉट फ्लूड दिस इज हीट कैपेसिटी रेट ऑफ द कोल्ड फ्लूड ओके नाउ कम बैक हेयर वॉट इज हैपनिंग इन अ पैरल फ्लो हीट एक्सचेंज लुक एट इट your hot fluid is coming in it is getting cooled along the path and finally it is going at th now cold fluid is coming in it is getting heated and finally going at tc now okay now if you want to calculate if somebody wants you to ask and that what is the overall heat transfer rate okay overall heat transfer rate you can calculate you can say that if i know the outlet inlet temperatures i can very well calculate what is the total heat transfer rate that is how much heat is lost by the hot fluid and gained by the cold fluid let us say i want you to ask you to calculate what is the surface area of the heat exchanger okay okay or what is the overall heat transfer coefficient how do you calculate that that's where the difficulty lies that's where the difficulty lies how do you do it how do you perform that calculations okay let me emphasize that part here one more time now what is happening look at it here the hot fluid is coming in okay and hot fluid is transferring heat to the cold fluid how does it transfer here let us say we take a small volume here okay and we want to understand how much heat is getting transferred dq amount of heat from cold fluid hot fluid to cold fluid let us say the heat transfer coefficient on this side is h not area is a not let us say conductivity of this plate is k and let us say this side heat convection coefficient is hi ai okay then how do you you can draw a network let us say this is th then you are having a convection resistance which is 1 over h not a not and let us say <coughs> then you have a conduction resistance i am not writing it just explicitly putting it conduction and then you have 1 over h i a i where it is reaching to the temperature of the cold fluid so th minus tci you can add all these resistance say this is r total and this is the del q amount of heat which is getting transferred from this point to this point to the fluid hot fluid <coughs> let us say i want to write del q as u into da into th minus tc okay this is how i want to write it up okay now i want to find out what is the overall heat transfer rate q okay how do i find it out th minus tc is no longer constant th minus tc is continuously changing along the pipe along the heat exchanger that is continuously changing if i want to write basically what i want to write is i want to write this kind of a form q a into delta t but what kind of delta t it has to be so as to write this expression that is not clear for me let us say if i integrate it right if you integrate it this side it will become q you have u you have th minus tc you have da but now th minus tc is not constant it is continuously varying along the space how do you write it a what form of the th minus tc you have to get it so that you can write finally the law in this form that's the question that we are trying to answer here okay. so now look at it d temperature if you calculate temperature difference at any section it is continuously vary along the heat exchanger 
at the inlet it is thi minus tci at the outlet it is th naught minus tc naught this temperature difference between the hot and the cold fluid is no longer constant along the cross section it keeps varying so if i want to write down the law in this form that is q is equals to u a delta t which delta t i should use because now delta t is no longer constant it turns out that this delta t we have to take some kind of a mean delta t for this variation which is very and that means turned out to be a log mean temperature difference okay how do you calculate log mean temperature difference log mean temperature difference is calculated as delta t i what is delta t i t h i minus t c i minus delta t naught which is t h naught minus t c naught divided by logarithmic of delta t i minus delta t naught so if you take this log mean temperature difference then you can use this in the expression okay. why i was not able to do it earlier because the temperature difference was not constant so that is why when you are using heat exchanger analysis when you are performing heat exchanger analysis and your objective is sometimes to work around u and areas and you have to use this kind of an expression the delta t what you have to use you have to use a log mean delta t there is another delta t also which can be used in calculation provided it is being told that delta t is called arithmetic mean average arithmetic mean average is very simple you take the average at the inlet and you take the average at the outlet and divide it by two other is log mean average which we are doing right now that that is delta t i minus delta t naught divided by in log delta t i divided by delta t naught okay <coughs> so this is parallel flow heat exchanger now the another kind of heat exchanger is called as counter flow heat exchanger in this heat exchanger your two fluid streams they flow in opposite direction okay so hot fluid will flow in one direction cold fluid will flow in other direction okay so you can see here hot fluid is flowing in this direction cold fluid is flowing in this direction in parallel flow heat exchanger look at it your outlet temperature of the cold fluid cannot exceed the outlet temperature of the hot fluid but here in counter flow heat exchanger there is a possibility it can exceed it can go higher than the hot how uh, the outlet temperature of the hot fluid why here it cannot flow because always hot fluid is transferring to the cold fluid hot fluid is transferring so cold fluid temperature cannot exceed hot fluid but here what we happens once we have changed the direction this hotter fluid is at a much higher temperature it, it there is a possibility that it can heat the cold fluid beyond th naught so that possibility exists okay here how do you calculate the log mean temperature difference same formula delta ti minus delta t naught in log delta ti by t naught only thing is while calculating ti you need to be careful here delta t, ti will be thi minus tc naught delta t naught will be th naught minus tc and again log mean temperature difference will be u a delta t l m there is another category of the problem see here my, my both fluids none of the fluid was undergoing a phase change when i say phase change that is phase change from liquid to vapor okay or that kind of a phenomena <coughs> in this case both were probably liquid or both were gases here also both were liquid or both were gases but here what is happening one might be liquid and another might be undergoing a phase transformation for example here here what is happening liquid is getting converted into vapor phase which is happening in the condenser which is kind of a phase change phenomena so your liquid is getting converted into vapor phase okay so probably you have a steam 
okay let us say you have a steam and then what you have you have a cold fluid which is flowing so steam is undergoing a phase change during phase change its temperature remains constant temperature of the fluid is not going changing but temperature of the cold fluid is continuously increasing because it is getting that heat from the hot fluid similar case is the case for a boiler or evaporator in which your cold fluid is undergoing a phase change okay it is undergoing a phase change and it is extracting the energy for the undergoing phase change from the hot fluid here okay. expressions for the formula remains the same thi only thing is in this case your hot fluid temperature was changing but here it is constant but still while calculating the log mean temperature you have to take th minus tci th minus th naught here also in this case also you have to take the temperature difference like thi minus tci th naught minus tc this is the case where you have two fluid streams and both fluid streams have same heat capacity that is cc is ch if that is the scenario both have the same heat capacity rate both have the same heat capacity rate then your log mean temperature difference is equal to delta ti minus delta t naught directly calculate this temperature difference or this temperature difference which will be equal to log mean temperature difference and you can use this formula here okay <coughs> so only thing is when you have to use log mean temperature difference you should know which temperature differences you have to calculate for parallel flow for counter flow let us say you have a condensing vapor case where steam is undergoing condensation or you have a evaporating liquid scenario or same heat capacity fluids flowing in the tubes let's look at this problem here he is saying a saturated steam at 1000 degree 100 degrees is condensing on the shell side of a shell a tube heat exchanger okay cooling water enters the tube at 30 degrees and leave at 70 degrees what is the arithmetic mean temperature difference if the arrangement is counter flow heat exchange let us look at it probably we'll understand this problem <coughs> sorry let us say so what is happening here is you see i will just draw the diagram so that it becomes clear more clear See here. So what is happening is here. Here your steam is coming in. This steam is flowing in this direction. And finally the steam is coming out. From here. And here your cold fluid is coming in. And it is flowing like this. This is a counter flow heat exchanger arrangement. Now, <coughs> it is mentioned as saturated steam at 100 degrees. And this steam is condensing. So, this is a case of a condensing vapor scenario that I discussed. So, one side, your steam is getting condensed at 100 degrees. So the temperature of this fluid is not going to change. It will be 100 degrees once it is flowing through it. Only what is happening is if here it is entering as vapor steam, it will leave as liquid this side. But temperature will be 100 degrees here and here. But the temperature of this hot cold fluid, it will increase from inlet to outlet so if you draw now 
the diagram let us say I, I draw a temperature versus x diagram okay look at the temperature of the hot fluid is always constant which is th equal to 100 degrees temperature of the cold fluid is changing how it is changing at the inlet it is 30 degrees at the outlet it is 70 degrees <coughs> okay so if i can say this is my th inlet this is tci i can say this is my tc naught and this is th naught so delta t i or 1 is thi minus tci which is 100 minus 30 which is 70 degrees delta t naught is th naught minus tc naught which is 100 minus 70 is 30 degrees what he is asking you to calculate? Arithmetic mean temperature difference. So delta T arithmetic, arithmetic mean is delta T i plus delta T naught divided by which is 70 plus 30 divided by 2 is 50 degrees. He is not asking you log mean temperature difference. He is asking you arithmetic mean temperature. It doesn't matter. Here I have drawn a parallel flow arrangement. You do the counter flow also. For the condensing vapor and evaporator case, it doesn't matter whether your arrangement is counter flow or parallel flow, you will get the same answer. Look at it. This is your condensing vapor. And I can draw like this kind of a scenario. Right? So then this will be how much? This is 30. This is 100. This is 70. This is 100. So my delta T i will be how much? 70. Delta T naught will be 30 degrees. I will still get the same answer. In this case also. Clear? Not clear? Anyone having any doubt here? Okay. Let's go ahead. Now we will look into another concept of heat exchanger analysis which is called effectiveness of heat exchanger okay how do you define the effectiveness okay Pariniti, you have okay how do you define effectiveness of heat exchanger okay <coughs> so let's let's define it how do we calculate the or define if you understand the definition of effectiveness there is second problem that we are going to solve you will clearly understand that part okay so ca can you take more example in the next class yeah, I can take more examples. Okay. You want to me to take more examples of the heat exchangers? You, you want me to take more examples of the heat exchanger, Pariniti? Okay. Yes. Yes, uh, I can take more examples, sure. Probably not a problem. I can take more examples. Actually, heat, heat transfer is supposed to be a complete, uh, if I say a complete, probably a complete uh, subject itself. But we are trying to cover it in probably two and a half hours, two hours or so. That is there. <coughs> so, let's say effectiveness. How do we define effectiveness? Okay. For the effectiveness, how do we define the effectiveness of heat exchangers? As I told you, you have two fluid streams which are coming in. One fluid stream, hot fluid, another is the cold fluid. Okay. 
<coughs> as I told you, if you write this energy balance, as I told you, heat gained by cold fluid is heat lost by the hot fluid. Okay. CC is what? CC is the heat capacity rate. It is basically the product of what? It is the product of mass flow rate into specific heat. Okay. Now, so this part is the heat gained by the cold fluid is equals to heat lost by the hot fluid. Let us say our CH is greater than CC. If CH is greater than CC for this equality to hold, TH0 minus THI will be less than TC0 minus TC. Okay. So that means and similarly, if you have CC greater than CH, your TC0 minus TCI will be less than TH0 minus THI. Conclusion from here is what? Conclusion is whichever fluid is having the minimum heat capacity rate, it will experience the maximum temperature difference. Okay. Whichever fluid, if the hot fluid or the cold fluid, out of the two, whichever have the minimum heat capacity rate, it will experience the maximum temperature difference. It will experience the maximum temperature difference. Okay. Now, let us say in a heat exchanger and that too in a counter flow heat exchanger, which is infinitely long, infinitely long counter flow heat exchanger, I want to do a hypothetical calculation for calculating what is the maximum possible heat transfer rate. It's a hypothetical case. Okay. I have made now counter flow heat exchanger infinitely long. Okay. So if my CC is less than CH, that is my cold fluid heat capacity is greater than let us say it is greater than ch okay so that means my cold fluid heat capacity rate is greater than hot fluid that means hot fluid is having minimum heat capacity so under this hypothetical case it will exp it can experience a maximum possible temperature difference what is the maximum possible temperature difference in a hypothetical case in a hypothetical case my hot fluid which is coming in at th naught I can cool it down to TCI only. Hypothetical case. Because this, this is the maximum temperature difference. THI minus TCI is the maximum temperature difference which exists between the fluids. So if I take a hypothetical scenario to calculate what is the maximum possible heat transfer rate. Okay. And consider that my cold fluid heat capacity is greater than hot fluid then hot fluid can go maximum possible temperature difference and hypothetically the maximum possible temperature difference will be I will cool hot fluid till TCI till here. So Q max will become CH THI minus TCI. Now I can take a different scenario. In this case my this is wrong here you can say cc is minimum the heat capacity of the cold fluid is minimum then cold fluid can experience maximum possible temperature difference what is that scenario in that case i can heat my cold fluid till the inlet temperature of the hot fluid so then my cold fluid will experience the maximum possible heat transfer rate pH maximum possible temperature difference. Okay. So in short, if I want to calculate the maximum value of the possible in a heat exchanger, hypothetical, that value is nothing but C minimum minus max C minimum into maximum possible temperature difference. C minimum, whether it is minimum for a cold fluid or hot fluid, you take the minimum value of C and take the maximum possible temperature difference that gives you the maximum possible heat transfer rate possible in a hypothetical scenario. So effectiveness is defined as actual heat transfer rate 
by maximum possible heat transfer rate. Maximum possible heat transfer rate is C minimum. Out of these two, whichever is the minimum, C minimum into maximum temperature difference, THI minus TCI. THI minus TCI. That is there. So I can define effectiveness as Q. That is Q gained by cold fluid. CC, TC naught minus TCI upon C min THI minus TCI. Or heat lost by the cold fluid. Because both are same only, right? CH, TH naught minus TCI. C min THI minus TCI. I can take this expression like this. Q as epsilon. Q max and I can substitute this relation and say Q is epsilon C min THI minus TC. Clear? Not clear. Effectiveness part. <coughs> is it clear? clear what I told you? Effectiveness? Hmm. Okay. See, very simple. You have to understand this part. What is maximum? And maximum is not realistic. It's a hypothetical scenario. We are considering counter flow heat exchanger and we are saying it is infinitely long. And then we are seeing what is the maximum possible temperature difference, which is this. Okay. Let us see now a problem on this case. Inlet outlet temperature of hot cold fluids in a double pipe counter flow heat exchanger are 220, 110, 80, 120 degrees. What values of effectiveness of heat exchanger and heat, what are the values of heat effectiveness of heat exchanger and heat capacity ratios? Let us look at it. You will understand more in this problem. First thing what you do whenever you want to solve the heat exchanger problem, right? Draw this TX diagram. This will help you, save you, not many times. Temperature versus X. So this is x0 is your inlet of one side and then your exit on the other side. So look at it here. What he is saying? Inlet, outlet. So hot fluid, THI, 220. Outlet, 100 degrees. Cold fluid, 80 degree, outlet 120 degrees. So look at it. One thing you notice now in this, what I mentioned you earlier. See here, this is THI which is 220 degrees which is this is pH naught which is 100 degrees see here TCI 80 degrees this is TC naught 120 degrees students note one important thing here in this example TH naught is greater than TC TC naught is greater than TH naught as I was telling you in parallel flow, it is not possible. TH naught cannot be greater than TC naught. In counter flow, it is possible. TC naught can be higher than this. Okay. Let us see how we can calculate the effectiveness. Calculate delta TI, which is THI minus TC naught. No, 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 let's not calculate like this. We have to calculate effectiveness, right? Let's let's first calculate. Let's let's calculate first THI minus TH naught. How much is this? This is 220 minus 100. This is 120, right? Let us calculate TC naught minus TCI. 120 minus 80. That is 40. Students, remember this C is M dot into specific heat. Okay. This is important. Now I am writing CC 
TC not minus TC I. So if I am writing CC, it is M dot C CPC CH THI minus TH naught. Look at it, students. Now you tell me which one is greater. This is how much CC into 40 and this is CH into 120. CC is 3 times CH. So CC is greater than CH, right? So C minimum is what? CH, right? And Q max will be what? It will be CH THI minus TCI, whichever is minimum and multiply it with maximum temperature difference. Effectiveness is what? Q by Q max. Right? So effectiveness Q is what? Now Q can be both. I can take this also. I can take this also. I will take this CH THI minus TH naught divided by C minimum. C minimum is CH only. THI minus TCI. So effectiveness will be what? THI is how much? 220. TH naught is how much? 120. THI is 220. TCI is how much? 80. So this is how much? Let's calculate. <coughs> sorry, sorry. So this, this is somewhere. I, I, is this right? This should be 100. Hmm. So 220 minus 100 divided by 140. This is sir, and, point. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, ask. Sir, yeah, in the formula that we have written, sir, both of them are not CH, CH. One, one will be, I believe, CC and THI no, minus no, no, no. is not. C, 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 C. Epsilon is Q by Q max. Sir. Ah. Now, if you look at Q, Q is the heat transfer rate, actual heat transfer rate. So whatever is lost by the cold fluid, same is gained by the cold fluid, right? Hot fluid, whatever is losing, same cold fluid is going to gain. Okay. So you can write both CH, THI, TH naught. This is C minimum. THI minus TCI, which is also equal to CC, TC naught minus TCI divided by C minimum THI minus TCI. I am not making any distinction because Q, this is equal to Q, which is A, both are same. Understood, not understood. Clear, not Understood. clear. Understood. Ah, uh, both are same only. So I smartly use that. <laughs> okay. What is heat capacity ratio? Okay, I missed this point. Heat capacity ratio. Heat capacity ratio is what? Heat capacity ratio is your C min by C max. This is your heat capacity ratio. Now C min is what? C min is CH. And C max is your CC. So that is CH by 3 times CH. Which is 0.33. This is the answer. Clear? Is this clear? Ah, good. Okay. Okay. Now I want to take slightly up some topic of thermodynamics. Just one topic which I want to discuss with you and another problem with that. 
which is basically the ideal gas model. So what happens when we do the thermodynamic analysis, right? When we are talking about thermodynamic, when we do thermodynamic analysis, for example, when we are studying, <coughs> basically the, the best possible example that we always studied is a fluid behind a piston cylinder arrangement. Okay. That is, we have a gas or we have a fluid behind a piston cylinder arrangement and that fluid basically undergoes different kind of processes whether it is a constant pressure process or constant volume process or an isothermal expansion or reversible adiabatic expansion or compression. The question that comes into mind, how we can model the behavior of that fluid. So one of the model for modeling that, that fluid is basically called as ideal gas model. That means I can use ideal gas equation of state to relate pressure, temperature and volume of the gas or volume of that fluid. Okay. I can say that fluid is behaving like an ideal gas. That simplifies a lot many things for me. Okay. This equation simplifies a lot many things for me. So what I use, I use an ideal gas equation. What is an ideal gas equation? Ideal gas equation is this equation. PV equal to MRT. This is the equation. So pressure into volume is equal to mass times R times T. What is P? P is your absolute pressure of the gas. Unit is in Pascal. V is your volume of the gas in meter cube. M is mass of the gas in kg. R is characteristic gas constant of the gas and T is temperature of the gas in Kelvin. If you want to calculate the gas constant, characteristic gas constant, that is nothing but universal gas constant divided by the molecular weight of the gas. Value of universal gas constant is 8.3114 kilojoule, kilomole per Kelvin. And M, M is the molecular weight or molecular mass of the gas. Okay. Now, if you substitute this here, right, for example, you substitute the value of R here. So what do you get? PV equal to N by M R U T. So this ratio of N by M right here, you look at it here. N by M here, this ratio here. Basically, this can be written as <coughs> your number of moles of the gas. Okay. So then you can write this relation as PV equal to NRUT. So these are the two standard forms in which we use the ideal gas equation. One is PV equal to MRT where mass is given and another is PV equal to NRUT where number of moles are specified. Now what happens sometimes when we are doing the analysis, right? As I told you, piston cylinder arrangement examples. And sometimes they specifically tell us that, okay, let us say we have a gas or we have a system and system is executing a particular process. So between two points, we want to relate certain properties. So if the system is undergoing a process in which mass of the system is not changing, then you can say mass at state point one is equal to mass at state point two. And if your system is, an, is, is behaving as an ideal gas, you can use ideal gas equation. You can say mass at state point 1 is same as mass at state point 2. And you can use this relation P1 V1 by T1 equal to P2 V2 by T2. Okay. Let me take one problem here probably that will explain something for you. Please. See this problem here. One way to cool an ideal gas, already he is telling you it is an ideal gas. One way to cool an ideal gas is to let it expand. So, when a certain gas under a pressure of 5 into 10 to power 6 Pascal at 25 degrees is allowed to expand three times its original volume, its final pressure becomes this. What is the final temperature of the system? Let us try to understand this part. Okay. See this. 
let us draw the pv diagram here i am just drawing the pv diagram because it is saying the expansion right so this is pressure this is my specific volume specific volume is volume divided by mass so what is happening during the expansion process specific volume will increase pressure will decrease this is let us say my state point one this is my state point two during the expansion process gas will expand its volume is going to increase and its pressure is going to decrease <coughs> so i will use any two state points so state point one he has given me i will say mass at that point is equals to mass at the same at state point two because nowhere mass of the system is changing it is constant and then i use ideal gas equation p1 v1 by m1 r t1 i can use r1 also or let me just just use r here so what do i get m1 as p1 v1 by r t1 so i get p1 v1 by r t1 equal to p2 v2 by r t2. so i get p1 v1 by t1 as p2 v2 by t2 as a mental picture if you want to imagine you can imagine something like this this might be just for your visualization you can think like this you have a piston cylinder arrangement okay and behind this piston cylinder arrangement this is your system okay, which is your ideal gas here your pressure is p1 volume is v1 and temperature is t1 and then it is expanding when it is expanding its volume is increasing you can substitute these values here 5 into 10 to power 6 volume is v1 temperature always used in kelvin in ideal gas equation 298 this is 1.07 10 to power 6 volume is 3 times v1 and your temperature is how much which you want to find out so if you calculate that what do you get 1.07 you get 191 clear is it clear students yeah clear sir ah simple problem right give me 10 more minutes i want to finish one more topic slight topic probably okay and a problem related to that okay i'll not take more than 10 minutes okay Sorry. Now I want to talk slightly about surface tension. Slightly. Probably talk talk about that. Okay. <clears throat> so I am not shifting from thermodynamics slightly to the fluid mechanics topic. So I want to talk about one particular specific topic which is the surface tension. So surface tension is a phenomena which you might have seen practically in your day-to-day -day experiences. Um, if you look at certain textbooks, they give pictures like uh, insects standing on probably a water film. Okay. Then a razor blade on the uh, floating or it's hanging on that water film. Okay. <clears throat> so these are all practical examples of the surface tension. So how does surface tension comes into picture and other things to understand that part? What we can look into is that we can consider particularly a container. Let us say you have a container and you consider two molecules. One molecule which is at the bottom 
interior and one is which is at the su surface the one which is at the top surface right this molecule is attracted equally by all the neighboring molecules okay so the force of attraction which is experienced by this molecule by the neighboring molecules it is similar in all directions okay so it is experiencing a symmetrical force distribution so net force acting on it is probably zero on that part but when you have a, when you look at the top molecule what happens so this molecule it experiences an asymmetric distribution of the forces and so in short there is a net force which acts on this molecule and this force is exerted by the molecules which are below it probably in the interior of the fluids they tends to pull the molecules on the surface in the downward direction okay and this particular force what it does it it gives an app the the physical consequence of this unbalanced force is that it creates a membrane on the top surface a thin elastic membrane on the top surface so your surface of the liquid the top surface of the liquid it tends to behave like a elastic membrane which is in tension okay so you can assume in that case like a, there is a tensile force which is acting on the top surface okay on the top surface if you take any plane any line there will be a tensile force that will be acting okay that's what the effect of surface tension is or in short the surface tension is if you want to understand it more so i have a picture here which is showing here so let us say you have this kind of an arrangement this is basically let us say you have a wire of certain thickness and you you have this kind of an another arrangement on the front of it let us say you dip this wire into a soap film you have some soap in the bucket you dip it and you take it outside so what you will see you will see two surfaces which will form of the soap one on the inner side of this which i am showing and one on the other side of this so there will be two films which are going to form soap film one will be forming on this side and another will be forming on this side so these are the two films that are going to form now let us say you tend to move this bar slightly up in this direction then what happens when you move this bar in this direction the film is going to get stretched both the films are going to get stretched okay both the films are going to get stretched okay thus so they are already behaving like an elastic membrane and you are stretching the elastic membrane okay so then what happens if you try to do a force balance what do you get so you are applying a force f okay on this bar and these two films the so films on the other side they will be opposing that forces and the magnitude of that forces will be nothing but sigma which is force per unit length okay multiplied by by the length okay so sigma into b so this is the entire length if you say this is the entire height if you want to consider sigma into b and this side it will be sigma into b so if you do the force balance what do you get force is 2 times sigma into b and if you calculate sigma sigma will be f into 2 times b okay so this is this is this is a little bit more intuitive example in terms of surface tension force if you want to imagine where you have taken a soap film and you are trying to stretch it okay and as you are trying to stretch the soap as you are trying to move the bar the soap films are trying to get extended or stretched so they are behaving like a stretch membranes basically thin elastic membranes okay now you can calculate the work done in stretching these films so work done will be force into distance which is force into delta x so what is force force is 2 times sigma into b times delta x so you can write this sigma into b into delta x into 2 will be delta a okay so what is this work done whatever work you have done what is that so surface tension you can think it also as the work done per unit increase in the surface area of the liquid film so you are doing certain work to increase the surface area of the film okay and also remember whenever we talk about surface tension right we need to whenever we talk let us say we are talking about surface tensions for liquids 
So we, we need to talk about interface, whether it is a liquid liquid interface or liquid gas interface. Okay. Always specify with respect to liquid, what is the other on the other side of the interface, for example. Okay. <coughs> now I want to take few more examples here. As I was saying, we all, when we are talking about the surface for liquids, right? Surface tension for liquids, it will be either at liquid liquid or liquid gas interface. Okay. So it is important to specify what is that adjacent liquid, whether it is a gas or a liquid because the value of surface tension will depend on that. Okay. So if you have any curved surface, right? In practice, let us say if you have any curved surface, right? A curved surface basically indicate there is a pressure difference on the two sides. So concave side on this side, you will have a higher pressure as compared to the other side. Okay. Let's say we take a liquid droplet here. So this is what I am taking a liquid droplet. Okay. So if you take a liquid droplet and cut it into two parts and you try to do the force balance, right? What, what kind of force balance you get? So on the external side, there is atmospheric pressure. It is being applied. The atmosphere is applying a pressure. And since it is a curved surface, right? Inner pressure will be higher as compared to the outer pressure. And let us say PI is the inner pressure here. Okay. So, and on the surface of this film, okay, on the surface of this, because here you have liquid and outside you have air. So it's a liquid and air interface. Okay. So if you cut it into two parts, what is the surface tension force? If you try to calculate here, that will be sigma times because for surface tension is force per unit length, sigma times 2 pi r. Okay. So if you do the force balance, what do you get? The net force in one direction, x, let us say in this direction is equals to the force in the other direction. You get pi minus p atmosphere into projected area projected area will be the area of the circle here is equals to 2 pi r into sigma okay so if you calculate pi minus p atmosphere you get 2 by r times sigma okay let us say now instead of taking the complete droplet you take a soap bubble fill soap bubble now bubble has two surfaces one outer surface and one inner surface there are two surfaces which are involved like how i told you that bead example so now if you do the force balance for this case right you will have pi minus p atmosphere into ap but now you have since you have two surfaces so your surface tension will be two times two times sigma into two pi r so it becomes four sigma pi r so your pi minus p atmosphere will be four r by Sigma. Okay. Let's take one example here. <coughs> See, what is the surface tension force in a soap bubble of 40 mm diameter when pressure inside is 2.5 Newton per meter square above the atmospheric pressure? Let me just solve this problem for you. Guys. So, as I told you, if this is a soap film, right? and a bubble so it will have two surfaces one surface and a second surface so this surface will apply a surface tension there will be a surface tension force because of the outer surface that will be sigma times 2 pi r and there will be surface tension force because of the inner surface also that which will also be sigma times 2 pi r because this is a curved surface pressure on this side let us say is p atmosphere and the inner side this side the pressure is pi so you can write pi minus p atmosphere times the projected area will be 4 pi sigma r so pi minus p atmosphere times ap which is pi r square is 4 pi sigma r so pi minus p atmosphere will be what it will be 4 times sigma times r so pi 
is P atmosphere plus 4 sigma R. What he is trying to calculate surface tensions. We can use this sigma is R by 4 into Pi minus P atmosphere. Sigma will be what? 20 divided by 4 into 2.5. <coughs> Sorry. Into 10 to power minus 3. I should not forget the unit of mm here. So this will be 2.5 into 20 into 10 to power minus 3 divided by 4. Sorry. It will be 0 0.0125 Newton meter. Yes. Okay. <coughs> sure, students. I think that's all from my side. Let me know, students, how was the class? How did you feel about the class? Please provide your uh, feedback. Sir, hmm. uh, one doubt was there. Hmm. Ask. Uh, this, uh, in the, uh, sir, in this problem, uh, how we hmm. got this uh, 2 pi r for like twice? Uh, I actually got confused in this. Sigma ah. 2 pi oh, r and oh, 2 pi r. Ah. Why, why it is because, see, it's a soap bubble. In case of a soap bubble, right, you will have two surfaces. You have two yes, surfaces. Sir, uh, uh, we so, are considering the sir, soap bubble is, has like finite thickness. Ah, yes. So it has two surfaces. So one, one is this surface and another is the inner surface. So oh, surface okay, tension sir. force will come for the inner one and the outer one also, both together. You have to consider that. Uh, okay, got, got it. Sir. And sir, this uh, 2 pi r term is like we are taking the circumference distance. Yes. Because surface tension for sigma is force per unit length. So if you want to calculate force, it should be sigma times n. Yeah, I got it, sir. Okay. Okay, students, let me know your feedback. How was the class, today's class? You were able to follow what I was trying to yes. teach? Hmm? Yes, sir. I think this class is great, sir. Your explanation is really good. So there is like, we are really happy that we got this lectures. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, the good if, uh, yeah, thank you. I tried my level best how much I can cover today. So if it was useful, uh, uh, okay, show previous screen. Okay, I will show the previous screen. Yeah, please look at it. Yeah, please. <coughs> Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, students. All the best for your exam. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay.